Hello and welcome to my review for Total War Saga Troy. The game's been out for a little while now, which has given me lots of time to really delve deep into it, experiencing multiple campaigns and countless battles. So we're going to be breaking everything down and seeing what's a worthwhile addition and what they should absolutely avoid in future. But before we do, this video is sponsored by Exter. Exter designs smart, stylish, and trackable wallets. Their flagship model, the Parliament Wallet, is slim and compact with an aluminium casing for your cards that is RFID protected, preventing identity theft and card skimming. The casing also provides quick access to your cards. At the press of a button, the cards fan out for you to take your pick and slot back into the wallet snugly. All of this is wrapped in premium quality leather that gives your wallet a unique look and feel as it ages. Exter's slim-fitting GPS tracker card can then be placed in the wallet and paired with your phone. The tracker is solar-powered with a two-hour charge lasting two months. The card lets you track its last location or set it to alert you should you get too far away from it. If you've misplaced your wallet, you can also call it through the app or just ask Siri or Google to call it through voice activation. If you've got your wallet but not your phone, you can also call your phone to find it and even use the tracker as a remote shutter so you can set up your camera to take a picture. Exter has a range of wallets and other products on their website, including phone and laptop cases. Using the link in the description of this video gets you a 20% discount code on checkout. That's 20% off your order for using the link in the description. Thank you again to Exter. Now, I just want to mention that not getting games early, being behind other creators all the time, means a sponsor like that is extremely helpful to allow me to take the time to do an in-depth review. So hopefully people can appreciate that. So normally, when reviewing Total War, I always start with the campaign first, and then I jump into the battles. But this time, we're going battles first. And the reason for that is, is that I think they suck, and I just want to get the bad stuff out of the way first. In my previous video on Troy, I mostly talked about the battles based on pre-release footage. I talked about things like bad collision, a lack of details, over-the-top animations, the lack of contact between troops, and the persistence of single entity units disrupting the flow of battle. As you can see, that hasn't changed with the final version. Now for people who know me, they know I would obviously prefer a realistic look to the game, a grounded feeling, some believability when it comes to battles, but that's just not happening here. So I could talk about it for 10 minutes and meme on the look of the units all day, but I've just I've kind of done that already. So leaving aside aesthetics, if we're just judging on pure gameplay, the battles are just extremely inconsistent. The two biggest factors for this are collision and morale. Collision has major issues in this game, with almost every unit in the game able to pull through an enemy really quickly and without any penalty to it, regardless of the unit density or the weight class of the unit. Here's two of the same high tier Trojan heavy spearmen, with no experience or buffs on them or generals doing anything to them. In this example, I just pulled the unit straight through, turned around, and then after some prolonged combat, we won the fight. Now, why did we win? I have no idea really, they're the same unit, so you'd think the one that pulled through probably would have lost. Now that's a bit more of a controlled test, but during battles we see the same thing happen very similarly. You blob up your units, you run through some spear units to break them much faster, this will actually stop the enemy from firing on your blob with their missiles because they don't want to hit their own troops. And it's not just me kind of gaming the AI, the AI will do it to you as well, it's actually kind of where I got the idea to do it. You might think that it's not that big of a deal, but it really is. Because of how this plays, the entire strategy of blocking streets, gates, or other choke points in a battle is really quite useless. Now the meta is just sort of blobbing and charging and also missiles, lots and lots of missiles. Now sometimes the AI will engage you instead of running through, and then you can prepare a flank, but sometimes they do run through, determined to get to the center of your city. And this is why it feels inconsistent. Sometimes they hold, sometimes they don't. I've also found that if you don't have guard mode turned on to prevent your units chasing the enemy, they'll just run through the enemy's blobs in pursuit of that one of them that broke. Normally in a Total War game, if about 20% of your unit becomes engaged, the whole unit will stop moving and fight. But in Troy, there just doesn't seem to be that threshold or it seems to be very large. And you can just keep moving through units pretty much uncontested. It gets to the extreme when you have stuff like melee chariots. 
Melee Chariots, as people have seen, are extremely powerful and basically ignore anything in front of them. And you might think, well, look, that's fair enough, they're supposed to be quite powerful. But even when they do stop, they rarely ever get cut down. They're unbelievably tanky. And I'm not really one for balance, especially in like single player games. I don't mind having some OP units now and then, but they're powerful to the point where they actually become unfun. Now we'll talk about morale. Morale in Troy, like Collision, is really inconsistent. I'll often see morale drop below zero in the unit stat cards and then the unit just doesn't break. This isn't because of any buff or unbreakable trait, it's just bugged or something, I don't know. Often when they do break, the units will come back, but they run in seemingly random directions, often headfirst into the enemy. It's okay though, because as we've learned, units run through each other anyway. So you end up playing a cat and mouse game where you have to leave your units chasing the routing units to prevent them from ever coming back, which is super tedious, and leaves the battlefield extremely scattered and micro-intensive. It's compounded further because of the reduced amount of cavalry, so you're just chasing units endlessly all the time to the edges of the map. Now because the game fields a lot of missiles at you, you're also often chasing dozens of units that are in skirmish mode. They're not actually broken, they're just running away from you. Missiles are definitely amongst the strongest and most powerful units in the game, with slingers now actually able to arc their shots over infantry, buildings and even walls. Previously slingers were considered kind of good for long range, but with that trade-off of needing clear visibility, now it's just another powerful unit, often just better than most archers in the game. So basically, in a nutshell, the battlefield interplay between units just feels really off to me. It might be because I'm so used to how it is in previous Total War games, but I do think objectively it's just not really as good. There's no artillery or pikes or real unit formations and very limited amounts of cavalry, so battles feel like there's less going on, less strategy in general. Now I know this is somewhat because of the time period, but it doesn't change the fact about what, how the battles play out. What does make things interesting is the terrain. The battlefields are awesome. With impassable cliffs and infield objects, it really feels like you're presented with different options depending on the terrain you're fighting on. The AI, however, like other Total War games, isn't really aware of the terrain. This is a bit of a pain to explain, but this is basically the best way to show what the AI is doing. They're kind of moving a formation, and then pathfinding is then figuring out how to get there. They're not actually aware of things, so all the terrain features are pretty much your advantage only. But it still makes things more interesting in general. The last thing I'm going to touch on for battles is the sieges. The sieges in Troy are okay. It's really dependent on the map and the layout that you get, whether or not they're going to be fun. Sometimes you have a big surroundable city, and other times you have some choke points that lead in, maybe some tall grass to hide units and things like that. But ultimately, you do kind of have to approach it the same way, as there's really only two options. You'll either break open a gate and climb some walls. Your siege equipment is indestructible, and every unit has ladders, so it's pretty straightforward what you can do. The options of destroying walls, either with artillery or sapping, setting fire to some buildings, or invading by sea aren't in Troy, so it does end up just feeling a little bit more limited. Oh, and I almost forgot, I never actually had the Siege of Troy. I played as Hector for a full campaign, Odysseus for another one, and then I only did a little bit of an Achilles campaign, and just tr Troy just never got attacked, so I really can't report on it. But it seems like any other siege, really, from what I've seen, except you might not have walls, depending on the situation, or it might be nighttime. Also, you can actually get siege towers in the game with a kind of a late technology, or... or a little earlier if you focus only on pushing towards that one. I just never did, and the towers are indestructible anyway, so it's, it's basically like having a faster ladder. Speaking of not having walls, battles for unwalled settlements are pretty much the same sort of thing as sieges. Though I personally actually really love these battle types in Total War games, it's really dependent on the map. Some maps are quite interesting with river crossings, bridges, and high ground, and others are just quite plain and quite open. The AI on these battles is hit and miss. The defenders seem to just sit there while getting shot at, and I'm not one to game the AI, so typically I try to encourage a fun battle and just run for it anyway, but the more meticulous players out there, no doubt, will sit back, use their ammo, and then just mop up a basically empty settlement. So from my experience, there's four battle types in Troy. There's the land, ambush, unwalled settlement, and walled city sieges. There's no naval battles, it just triggers a land battle that's on an island setting, and there's no fort battles. There's no quests or historical battles either, so it's a little bit limiting. And uh, not to be too dramatic, but I do think these are probably the worst battles in the franchise to date. They're basically just mediocre, they're fine, 
but I think any other Total War game does do them better. So for a lot of people, if Troy is your first Total War game, maybe you got it for free, and you're watching and you're thinking, I don't know, I enjoyed these battles just fine. That's great. I implore you to check out Warhammer 2, Rome 2, or Shogun 2, and you'll basically have your mind blown by how good they can be. Now, to counter some of my toxicity, I do want to reiterate that the landscapes are really high quality. It's pretty much the only thing that I would want to take from the battle side of the game to continue into the series. There's lots of maps and they actually look really, really good. It reminds me of one of the first times we saw battles for Rome 2 back in 2012. The Teutoburg Forest map for Rome 2 is really detailed. People assumed, what if all the battles look like this? Can that even happen? But in Troy, they actually do kind of look like that, so it's really impressive. The island maps as well are just extremely pretty, like it, it makes me yearn for some real naval battles. So again, big, big props to the environment team. They do really get better with each game. And as a side note, this is easily the best grass I think I've ever seen, so there is that. So, moving on now to the campaign. Remember I said earlier, I want to get the bad stuff out of the way first, and that for me was largely the battles. But the campaign, I think the campaign's really quite good. Definitely needs some tweaking, but overall, it's a very fun, stylish, thematic campaign with some really innovative mechanics and ideas. You've got eight factions split into two groups, the Danans with Achilles, Agamemnon, Odysseus, and Menelaus, and then the Trojans with Hector, Paris, Aeneas, and Sarpedon. Each of these factions have their own unique mechanics, and it's actually pretty meaningful stuff that definitely differentiates how you play, and it's fun in its own way. Let's do a bit of a rapid-fire look at some of the unique mechanics. So Hector and Paris share one of the mechanics called Priam's Heir. So for those who don't know, Hector and Paris are brothers. Priam is their father, living in Troy. Now if you fulfill certain optional objectives and requirements for Priam, you gain benevolence with them. Your brother is doing the same, and you basically are in competition with each other to best each other and show your dad that you should be the rightful ruler. Whoever wins gets Troy and confederates the other brother's territories and holdings. It's really, really cool because I don't think I've ever experienced being in competition with an ally in a Total War game. And you can do things to undermine each other if you want as well. You might be thinking, well, I'll just attack them, you know, just take them out. And you could do that, I guess, but if you attack your brother, your dad's not gonna like it, and you're also just hurting yourself in the long run, as then your confederation's gonna be smaller. So, I just think it's a really cool mechanic that I had a lot of fun with. You know, I wanted Hector and Paris to both do well, but I had to make sure I was doing better. I've never had that before. The next one for Hector is super interesting as well. It's the Asawan League. Basically, this means that as Hector forms more allies, and they collectively control more territory, they get benefits like reduced recruitment and upkeep costs, increased movement range and stronger morale when fighting in defensive home territory. It's really cool again because you're looking to keep growing your allies around you which just isn't really something that you do in Total War very often. Paris then has Helen as a character that he can place in different regions and doing so boosts the regions that she's in but also keeping her close to his army will give him benefits as well. So it's kind of a nice dynamic between do you want to help out the towns? Is she going to be safe where she is? Because she could get captured and you have to get her back. Or do you want to kind of keep her close to the army, keep moving around to gain buffs that way? Funny thing, actually, I saw that in my campaign as Hector was that Helen divorced Paris after I confederated him, apparently for some other dude. So she was really just in it to be queen after all. As soon as that confederation happened, she was out of there. Jokes aside, I don't think she could actually move after the confederation. She was kind of just stuck With on a random island. And skill. Some other standout mechanics are that of Agamemnon. He has his own court system and can actually vassalize and extort other factions for more resources, while Manolaus can recruit from his allies' rosters and instantly colonize raised territories without needing to be there. Achilles has this whole hot-blooded trait-changing effect, which to be honest just didn't seem to work for me, but he also has something called the Living Legend, where other characters challenge him to battle, and if you defeat them, you become more famous, spreading your influence and keeping costs down. With regards to the hot blood thing, it was building up all these different traits, and every time I would hit a milestone, it would just reset to nothing. So I just, I don't know what was up with it, if I was reading it wrong. I didn't play that much Achilles, so it seemed interesting, but I just didn't see the effects of it. Without going into every single character here, the others also have equally involved mechanics, such as their own resource systems, their own mission systems, and differing playstyles with their own unique buildings, and 
different rule sets about where they can kind of go. And I think that they've really done a brilliant job making the factions play differently. With perhaps the exception of being able to vassalize as Agamemnon, each unique playstyle felt like it was created for the faction, rather than being something that felt like other factions maybe should have had access to and was artificially split up between them. So that was a look at the unique mechanics of different factions. Now let's take a look at some of the shared mechanics that everybody has access to. As is standard now in Total War games, each faction has their own set of generic victory conditions for Total Conquest, but in Troy they also have a second set called Homeric Victory Conditions, usually asking you to complete a series of epic missions that are basically just some milestone objectives with fairly big payoffs. Now from my experience, these give your campaign a real focus if you're feeling a bit lost and wondering what to do next. They often quote the Iliad and build up a story of your character over time. It's nice flavor, and it just brings the setting to life a little bit more. Next is the Royal Decrees. This is basically your technology screen, but rather disappointingly, it's the same for every faction. There's five categories of decree that loosely fit each of the five resources. It just feels like a kind of arbitrary screen of buffs. It's fine, but it is just like a little bit lacking. Next up is the Divine Will. In Troy, there are seven gods that you can gain favor with. Each of the gods have three tiers of worship that provide you with a series of buffs that specialize either in economic, military, or agent benefits. Now while it's mostly just buffs to certain things, reaching the third tier with any god also grants you recruitment of a powerful unique agent or powerful mythical unit. It's not a linear progression either, gods have a decay rate and over time they'll lose favor with you, but you can slow this down with agents like priestesses who specialize in those deities. To gain favor with different gods, you can either build temples in their name, use agents to boost existing temples, and periodically perform a hecatomb sacrifice. You can also perform a prayer to a god, which doesn't raise its favor, but instead it activates another type of buff that becomes stronger the more favor you already have with them. So an example is praying to Poseidon to be immune to deep sea attrition for a few turns, or praying to a full tier 3 Ares to give you a negative 20% morale penalty to the enemy, so they can be really considerable effects. I found the gods to be quite an interesting mechanic as well. Now, I'm not a big stats guy, which is kind of funny in these games, which are just becoming increasingly about modifiers and buffs and debuffs. So when I see a wall of text of effects, I sort of just glaze over. But I did use it to get the main effects, like ignoring attrition and getting new units. And I found the overall gaining favor to be just a bit simplistic. Building a temple gives you 100 favor with a god, but it falls off over time. So if you destroy the temple and you build it again, you get 100 favor again, so it's a bit weird. Seems like it would have made a bit more sense maybe to get favor per turn from temples, like they generate it, maybe with an upkeep cost of gold per turn, like you're kind of paying sacrifices or whatever, rather than that static amount um, that just seems to get reduced. I don't know. While the effects definitely had impact, I feel there just could have been more done with how you interact with the system. Let's move on now to the building system. This is, after all, where you're kind of spending a lot of your time on the campaign. Troy uses the same province system that we've seen in Rome 2 and Warhammer 1 and 2, specifically the idea of having two, three, or four regions in a full contained province. All regions within a province will share their culture, which in Troy is called influence, public order, which is called happiness, and their recruitment options. Influence in Troy doesn't affect happiness. Instead, having high influence actually means you get a bonus to resource production, which is kind of a neat concept. The cities can reach level 5 and build a much wider range of buildings in general, including special faction buildings, administration for the province, and temples. All of these buildings provide straight benefits. There's no drawbacks, making it almost impossible to mismanage. The most interesting aspect is that you can only build one temple per city, so early on, you kind of have to specialize with just one or two gods. The minor settlements in Troy are all attached to a resource, be it food, wood, stone, bronze, or gold. These settlements all have five resource buildings that you can build in them that are geared specifically towards exploiting whatever that resource is that's there. From left to right, we have gaining the resource with no drawbacks, gaining the resource with a unique effect at the expense of influence, gaining a percentage increase to all resources at the expense of happiness, gaining a large amount of the resource at the expense of gold when constructing it, and gaining a medium amount at the expense of growth. So here, you can decide to get more resources at the expense of something that you think you can maintain in the province, be it influence, happiness, gold, or growth. 
To me, trade-offs like this are what make the building system fun. And while still relatively simple, this little bit went a long way to make planning out a good province feel a bit more rewarding. I especially like that if you have that high influence in the province, you get a big bonus to resources depending on the building. So you know that if you, you don't think you're going to have high influence for a while, you can choose other options instead. There's also province unique buildings indicated by a little icon on the region. Now for instance, the island of Lesbos has harpies available for recruitment. So you can choose to build the Harpy Lookout and recruit them here, but they're also capped globally based on how many Harpy Lookouts you built. So you can then decide if you want to build a special building on top of the resources as well, increasing how many Harpies you can field at the expense of getting more bronze and stone. Those kind of trade-offs are rare, but it's still really enjoyable to weigh them up when you do come across them. On a personal note, I love the location-specific units. They're available to any faction, and they kind of gave you that gotta catch them all feeling of trying to locate the centaurs, the giants, the minotaurs, and other mythical units. So, we touched a little bit on the five resources, and as mentioned, you now have food and bronze, which are largely used for recruiting and paying the upkeep of military units, wood and stone, which is primarily used for construction, and then gold, which is used for high-tier units, buildings, prayers, and some agent actions. Every now and then, there's some crossover where bronze is needed for a high-tier building, or wood is needed for a unit like chariots, but there is but one universal you'll need all the time, and that's food. It's needed for every military unit you field, every general and every agent. It is your base upkeep resource, and you're gonna need a lot of it. The game can feel a little bit stingy when it comes to providing it, especially when you start recruiting more armies. You get that percentage upkeep penalty to everything to hold you back called supply lines. So you make a new army, the percentage goes up, and suddenly all armies cost more. Food kind of makes sense to be feeding an army. Why this army needs more than it did before doesn't make sense, but it is a game. Which leads me to bartering. You can of course trade for resources with other factions and they show you what they have and what they're in need of. As many have seen by now, this system, while good in premise, is heavily abusable in many ways. Cancelling a barter deal with someone doesn't affect your overall reliability rating, allowing you to basically rob every faction you want. And there's also what appears to be a calculation error in terms of weighing up the odds, where you can give just one food per month and then make the deal go through with the highest positivity rating. As a result, if you don't ignore the feature, you're basically just going to be accumulating fast riches and ruin your own fun. So this feature is in dire need of a patch. I'd say about 50% of the time it works fine though, although you do get spammed each turn with several deals, which can also be quite annoying. It would be nice to we just lock a resource so that nobody asks you for a specific thing. The multi-resource system in Troy is a really good step forward for the franchise, just because it adds some depth back into how you manage things. Every time Total War adds a little bit of complexity or depth, I see nothing but praise for the feature, whether it be more involved diplomacy, deeper technology and skill trees, dynamic traits, item crafting, you name it. If it's adding depth, players typically, from what I've seen, seem to love it. So having five resources to manage instead of one is a nice change of pace. And with gold being a finite resource on the map, there is a real weight and consequence to losing units or buildings that you invested gold into because you're never going to get it back. I'd still love to see a population system make its return in future and possibly see it contribute to how the various resources are made. Troy still has that kind of infinite replenishment type gameplay where the loss of 100 men just doesn't matter so long as the unit survives. A population metric would make it matter and it also gives a weight to the world. Before moving on, we'll quickly touch on agents. I actually really quite like the agents in Troy. Simplifying things a bit, you know, envoys deal with mostly administration in towns and armies. Spies deal with sabotage and uncovering the map. And priestesses deal with the gods and happiness. They each have about six or seven unique things that they can do, from passive abilities, given their circumstances, to more active abilities when they target settlements, armies, or other agents. They then have their own skills and skill trees that you can level up to make them more powerful. There's also epic agents that you get from missions and the gods that are very specialized in what they do and they typically only exist for a few turns. A gorgon is disruptive to foreign armies and garrisons, a great defender. A satyr increases growth and happiness of a town and when consumed instantly finishes all the construction there. And a seer gets a little pilgrimage mission to give you a benefit and can also perform a ritual to grant maximum favor with a god but consumes the agent. For me, I just found them to be a pretty fun side game to manage. I've heard people say that the game has lots of agent spam, but I personally have not seen that in any of my campaigns. I have seen that spies are super powerful, so again, 
even though I'm not one for balance in single player games too much, you know, I don't mind a little bit of OP-ness here and there. Ha, <laughs> penis. They're powerful to the point of making the game a bit too easy, so hopefully they can be nerfed a little. The last thing to mention for the game is the UI and the quality of life features that the game has introduced. It's often taken for granted, but when it comes to UI and strategy games, I think maybe Civilization and Total War are leagues ahead of any other competition. While I think the unit card backdrops can look a little bit ugly and maybe the sheer amount of icons on screen is a bit much, everything in the UI is really well designed, contained and has its own clear section. If you're a new player and you haven't played in a while, that help icon that overlays everything on the screen, it is sorely missed when you change to another game. The sound design is also very complementary to it as well, and that's the sound design within the UI. There's punchy effects for toggling buttons, even the entire top bar has that list of buttons, each having their own unique sound. It's, there's no reason for that really, but it actually just adds up as these little details that deliver a feeling of strong quality and polish and recognition the more and more you click them. which is really noticeable on the campaign. My favorite new addition is the little list of things that you could do before you end your turn right next to the end turn button. It tells you about upgrades, buildings, movement that you've left unchecked and more. And while nod. we've had examples of this before in the franchise, this little list solution with its own little filters as well, it's a brilliant idea. It's like the best thing in the game. Of course, as well, it almost goes without saying that while the UI may be up there with the likes of Civilization for its quality, the visuals on the campaign map are really the best in the strategy genre. The map runs extremely well and looks stunning. With each game, it just seems to get better and better. With the day and night cycle, it never feels static either. And at night, you can actually hear crickets and other creatures that you don't hear during the day. And during the day, you'll hear birds and a lot more activity in general. I mean, there is no need for that level of detail, but it's awesome to see shine through. So that's it for my review of Total War Saga Troy. Like I said, battles leave a lot to be desired, which is really unfortunate as I think that campaign is really up there with some of Total War's best, especially if they can work out the kind of exploits and balance kinks that they have. I didn't mention it, but there are some skills and skill trees that just further make battles like completely ridiculous to play. And this is as a player who isn't trying to game the game at all. If you do, you will just see insane results. For me, I would just absolutely love it if there was an option to give the heroes their own little bodyguard units and just tighten up the morale and collision system a bit. It's never going to be the grounded and gritty take on the era that I want it to be. And it's never going to have like the depth of a paradox game on the campaign because it's, it's just not trying to do that. So I've kind of given up banging the drum about that. If they ever go back to it and the more kind of interesting and complex mechanics they add, I'll be singing their praises so much that you'll think I worked there. All right. Thanks again for the support lately. Sorry I'm late to my reviews. Next up is Crusader Kings 3, which I think this video is probably going to release on the same day as. Make sure if you enjoyed these types of videos to let me know with a like. Let me know what you think of Troy in the comments. Consider joining our Discord where we talk about strategy and PC games. Follow me on social media to never miss a video. Check out my Let's Play channel and my Twitch channel. There's five videos a week and five streams a week there. There's even more shit elsewhere, but I think that's enough. I'll see you in the next one. Let's go. He'll never see me coming. Jesus Christ. Yes. Ha ha ha!